Uh, the failure of the Democratic Party in the national election is generally conceded to have told us something about the collapse of liberalism as we have known it during the past half century. There are those who A, insist the pieces can be picked up and reassembled, B, those who feel we should be grown up about the collapse of liberalism and move to the realism of conservative policies, and see those who believe we should push out to the left. We have no representative here today of the first point of view to argue that Humpty Dumpty could be put together again accordingly. We will ventilate the other two alternatives. Our Emmett Terrell's new book is called, appropriately, The Liberal Crack-Up. Mr. Terrell has been designated by no less an authority on the subject than Tom Wolfe, as quotes the funniest political essayist to come along in years. The book is funny, but also seeks to be lethal, chronicling the disintegration of liberal illusions. Mr. Turtle is the editor of the American Spectator, the conservative monthly published out of Bloomington, Indiana. Bob Turtle is a graduate of the University of Indiana, where he also took an MA in 1967. He founded, in 1970, the journal then called The Alternative, now The Spectator. He is the author of Public Nuisances and a syndicated columnist who appears regularly in the Washington Post, a singular achievement. Uh, Christopher Hitchens, representing the left, was born in England, went to the Lay School in Cambridge and to Balliol in Oxford. During the 70s, he wrote for the New Statesman since 1981. He has served as the Washington columnist for the nation, as also for the London well, Spectator. What are your remarks on the implications of these last uh, two defeats? Uh, do you think it was simply reactive against uh, incompetence, or do you think it actually was... Uh, uh, a rejection of implied, uh, uh, of implied political philosophy. Well, I never thought I'd hear myself uh, saying this, but I, I, I'd like to recall to you a very striking phrase, I thought a rather clever phrase, of uh, Norman Podhoretz uh, commenting on the 1980 victory of the Reagan-Bush team, um, I think in commentary, and saying this is the election that Watergate postponed. Mm -hmm. I thought that was a clever remark. I also thought it was more revealing than it was intended to be. In order to take the line of crack up that Mr. Terrell has offered us um, in his book and elsewhere, um, you've got to really believe that it was a good thing that George McGovern lost the 1972 election. Now, I think that's quite a hard position to uphold. I don't think that a liberal li a socialist like myself or any other kind of radical can look back and say it's a jolly good thing that Nixon and Agnew, Agnew won that, that time. We had McGovern won would have been spared, as well as Mrs. Kirkpatrick of the United Nations and various other bizarre phenomena in the Democratic Party, we'd have been spared the um, appalling corruption amounting practically to a coup against the Constitution in Washington. I think we would have been spared the particularly abysmal way that the Vietnam well, and the Cambodia that, wars ended, and we, and we would have been spared the 1974 uh, near war between Greece and Turkey and the destruction and dismemberment of Cyprus. Up until now, we um, spared knowledge that we came close to a constitutional coup. Tell me more about it. Well, I, in, in, my, in my view, what was uh, at stake at Watergate was not merely, as it were, the right of those at the top or in power to line their pockets or appoint their friends, but it was, under especially Attorney General Mitchell, the use, and this I call um, high corruption, of police and other federal agencies as if they were private property, the use of the IRS, the FBI, and the CIA against political opponents, oh, uh, against Mr. pluralism, Mr. as it were. I mean, a very serious, yeah, you, as you, it were, configuration of you um, may, You may be a little bit behind in your readings on what happens in America. It was Robert Kennedy, for instance, who got the sex tapes on uh, uh, Martin Luther King, it was FDR, uh, mm -hmm. who in, engaged in tapes just as fast as the evolution of technology permitted to do so. Um, so, I, so I, uh, think, you, um, I think you'll lot, find... Lots of friends of Roosevelt got rich. My, uh, my, withers, friends got rich, so. my withers, Mr. Bucky, are unrung. I mean, I'm, I never tire of pointing that out in every uh, review of a Kennedy depredation that I do. In fact, I'm on record, I think, this week in the Literary Review uh, about, uh, about that in the, the review of the Collier Horowitz book on the Kennedys. Of course, everyone has done it. I'm saying that in Watergate, a quantity was turning into quality, that there was an attempt to institutionalize the use of uh, agencies of the state as a private political police force. If you don't think that's more serious, well, I that's your problem I, I, and not I, mine. I, I would think it more serious if it was so, but I think that the FBI was used much more widely by the predecessor of Mr. Nixon uh, for such purposes as you describe as by Nixon. Uh, if, if, I'm very mildly surprised if you think that uh, Mr. Nixon's uh, political appetite 
to control others ever reached to the limits of L.B. Johnson's, uh, L.B. Day's did. A position, by the way, which, uh, which is uh, reiterated by many friends of L.B. Day's political program. Mr. Buckley, if I was to say to you that um, the, the government of um, Poland is a, is a grand uh, tyranny against its people, and you were to say, yes, but so is Czechoslovakia and so is Hungary, what is the point you're making? Well, the point you, making, you mentioned the many enemies, you, you mentioned other enemies of mine in yeah. an attempt to deflect from yeah. what must be a surely an obvious point, the fact which is that the Nixon victory in 1972, the beginning of what we're asked to hail and be pleased about as a liberal crack up, was a disaster for the United States, for its democracy and for its institutions. This is well, it, it was or would you, I mean, perhaps you, you haven't said, Mr. Terrell, would you rather... It was certainly um, a disaster for, for Cambodia and certainly a disaster for South uh, Vietnam. Uh, unhappily, it was a democratically controlled House, a democratically controlled Senate that sealed uh, the coffin lid in that situation. I'm not saying that Caligula is the same uh, as LBJ and that I have to mention uh, 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 him if I mention Nixon. I was simply isolating your remark that we had evolutionized America into a situation in which we were uniquely menaced, which is anti-historical. But imagine, by the way, thinking that, that, the, Mag that uh, the presidency of uh, George McGovern would have somehow uh, uh, been a great moment for American, uh, for American public policy and statecraft. I mean, this is the thing about... Yes, this I'm, is, I mean, I'm, you I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not a, a praiser of politicians, um, but I don't find... I think it was yesterday in your column in the Post, you referred to the McGovern campaign as a gaudy campaign, which it struck me was a, a most extraordinary use of words for someone so, as it were, painfully honest and unglamorous. Um, I... You didn't, well, you didn't think the mob surrounding him maintain. was gaudy? Uh, no, I certainly did not. I mean, who, who, or who on earth do you have in mind? Thomas Eagleton? The whole, the whole, well, Tom, um, it was rather bizarre. Spectacular. Well, you might say it was a spectacular moment. person. I think Gordy would be pushing it a little. I simply, I just think people me. should he, be, uh, um, you, you thought those people were kind of Brooks I think Brothers? People should be, should, should take, should accept the logical and probable consequences of what they say. What you say is it was a good thing. What you must believe is it was a good thing with Nixon and Agnew won that election. Oh, God, I say yes. that's the root, that's, that's the, <laughs> that is the root problem with um, As a matter of fact, I, the book I, I, I tend to be more with you, but, but for reasons that you, that will leave you unsmiling. <laughs> Namely that, uh, I, expect uh, I, I would much rather have had McGovern uh, be, be there when we let down our allies in uh, Southeast Asia than to have had Nixon do it. Nixon's preoccupation with Watergate did two things. Number one, it preoccupied him. Number two, uh, it weakened executive power so that uh, Congress was able to do that which it most probably could not have done under other circumstances. As I say, I would rather McGovern have presided over those four years of Nixon. No, but actually, you, you, you um, unfortunately, you, um, you fail of your effect. Your, your answer does make me smile, because you haven't got the point that Watergate was the nemesis of a system of lying and deceit that originated in the need to lie about the war in, in, in Indochina, <laughs> Vietnam, Cambodia. That was what necessitated the, well, I, the, the making of I would lying and I, deceit and the destabilization of opponents I thought it was original into, a, into, a, um, into a, uh, an institutional well, rather in the, than in the a random place, the, political the, In the first place, the principle uh, lie, uh, uh, if we got to taxonomize these things, uh, it dates back to Gulf of Tonkin, which had nothing to do with the public administration. Uh, which was accepted by the Senate with only two dissenting votes, and which was proclaimed by Lyndon Johnson. So that if Why do you feel this somehow negates what I say, the fact that it was a Democrat? Well, uh, I don't doubt, Mr. Hitchens, that you don't like the American system. You're perfectly free to despise it. I don't like you to say, simply conveniently, that that which you don't like is exclusively associated with Republican presidents, that's all. I made no such... Um Allegation. We're discussing. Yeah, you're talking about we're the discussing unique, unique dangers of the no, Watergate we're, we're era. We are discussing. We're discussing liberalism. I made the citation of George McGovern. It seems to me that by saying of George McGovern, he isn't Lyndon Johnson. One sticking to the truth and to say Lyndon Johnson is a liberal is stretching it even further. Oh, than Mr. Well, does in his he's, book. He's much worse than Lyndon Johnson. Here we are. Anybody who would vote for Henry Wallace and refuses to apologize for it 25 years later is saying the fact that he was perfectly uh, comfortable with Stalinist policies and with conciliation towards Stalinism in, in Europe. And uh, George McGovern, who's a friend of mine, uh, uh, simply declines to apologize for the equivalent of voting for Hitler in 1932. Well, there may, be, there may be loyalty tests you can set that he can't pass, mm -hmm. but I still think that to mention him and Lyndon Johnson in the same breath, say they're both Democrats, which means that they're almost liberals, and therefore that proves it, 
is worse than the ahistorical uh, that you accuse me of. Well, well, we, I thought we were sticking to well, liberalism. They, they both both call how can we, liberals. They how both we stick to liberalism? If you, how can we even discuss liberalism with you if you won't accept that, that George McGovern was a liberal? I mean, that uh, oh, LBJ I'm, was I'm, a liberal. I'm claiming that... Uh, I mean, we have a real problem here. We should have a Bircher here, too, because you two... With your with your extreme yeah, views of politics in this country, you could get along perfectly. No, but I think it's helpful that you that you claim Johnson's a liberal because I think it shows what the essential category mistake of your book is that mm -hmm. a liberal is someone who you call a liberal, and um, the the elasticity of your definition allows you what to have you a feral a feral rom. Yeah. But I mean, if you what can is find well, if in, you, one if you, book, in one of his books, John Dewey, some patient scholar discovered, used the word uh, liberal to mean twenty three different things, and it's true about the elasticity of the word. Uh, after all, there was not once all that long ago that Woodrow Wilson said the history of man's, uh, the history of liberalism is the history of man's efforts to restrain the growth of government. So, so we, we, sure. acknowledge, we acknowledge it. But uh, as liberal is used, let's say an ADA liberal is something both of them would have designated themselves as being. How's that? Well, Johnson and the ADA were not pals. Oh, for God's sake. Johnson... No, no, no. The ADA opposed Johnson back when he was thought of as being a Southern regenerate. Mm -hmm. They were wildly enthusiastic about him ever since. The president of the ADA, Don Kenneth Galbraith, yes. uh, as recently as two weeks ago, said that LBJ was a great saint of liberalism, unfortunately tainted by the commitment to the Vietnamese war. Well, that's you know what like saying, as uh, Hemingway guys. said about your aunt, if she had cojones, would be your uncle. I mean, Now that's why, that's helpful I think, because that gets us nearer to the book, which I was anxious to plug as Mr. Terrell is. Um, his book is an attack on the left, with which I am prepared to associate myself. Mm -hmm. And I think we may have, though this may have been intensely boring for everyone to watch, I think we've cleared the ground in a sense. I mean, he's not really attacking Lyndon Johnson in his book, is I, he's attacking the, he's attacking the, the left. Yes, he is the, attacking, uh, the, attacking the, the left that um, survived and um, came out of the civil rights movement, the women's movement, and the well, movement against that. the Vietnam War. You say it, Mr. Uh, Terrell, who you attack Well, I mean, I, I don't... See, I'm, I'm a much more peaceful man than you are, Christopher. I'm not attacking anyone. I'm merely describing what happened in the 1970s. And what happened in the 1970s uh, is, uh, was the breakdown of American liberalism into a riot of enthusiasms. And if you would like to read, perhaps we have some organ music. Bill, did you bring your harpsichord? Christopher's about to read. Um, I don't... Harpsichord well, is very poor organ music. I, uh, I, don't, think, <laughs> I don't think that peaceful, um, peaceful isn't a word I'm in search of, but if you say you don't attack anyone, how come that you say the vast majority of feminists were disagreeable misanthropes, horrible to behold, uncouth and unlovely. They were inferior women, contemptuous of the superior women, who through their charm and intellect have so often been able to establish such enviable lives for themselves. I could go on. I mean, I will if you like. Go on, it's beautiful. Why did you plug your own book? I would but say that was a critical... I would uh, say that was a... Uh, use in my opinion, it's a clinical description. Not, 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 not elegant, not elegant, but certainly not I'm peaceful. Just trying to point out I know the difference between agreeable women and disagreeable women. Well, you, yes, you, I, you have a number of roguish asides about yourself on this point, but the, you, you have a certain want of gallantry when you discuss uh, the women's movement in general, uh, one that I'm, I'm surprised in. They, they Someone who is so fond of conservative affectations about here the good are. old stylish days. Here we are again. Yeah, but Mr. Why, why, why are you actually to say that you don't attack people as you do? Now, well, I, I just would like to make one point here. This man has lived on terminological inexactitude. He's lived on the misnomers that came out of the 1970s uh, because these misnomers make it easier for him to make the ideological points he wants to make. For instance, he just referred to the women's movement, and I suspect he doesn't blanch when he sees the New York Times refer to the National Organization for Women representing the women's movement. But what essentially, what of course, he, to be precise, the women's movement is a misnomer. It refers to some women's movement, uh, those women being well, the feminists. feminists. I mean, there is no such thing in this country as the women's movement. Uh, it doesn't in any way represent uh, the women I associate with, the feminists don't in any way represent the uh, happy, the lucky women, women I associate with, race, and, and it doesn't represent the views of all those who voted for Ronald Reagan. I'm sure that's true too. So in other words, we got you again. Didn't and I'm sure a woman would have to. Would, I'm sure a woman would have to be. I somehow I don't feel any sort of pain in my ribs. I, perhaps I should have noticed. He began by saying you were um, um, I know a rapier when I see one, and I know when I've been pronged. No, but you, um, no, I'm sure I am. I'm quite happy to grant you that a woman would have to be happy or lucky to associate with you. But um, if I said the women's movement, I don't mean to say that I don't recognize women as a sex, as well as a movement, too. Um, terminological inexactitude is, um, um, 
not what you meant to say, is it? Uh, it's exactly what you. Um, it's exactly well, what it's you. It's a euphemism, of course, you intended to say. No, you want to call me a liar? No, no, no! I wouldn't call you a liar because I believe you well, are. You know the you of, you know the you are of the deluded. You understand I'm the not going to call you a liar. No, no, I'm not going to call you a liar. I believe no. that you really and do, really and truly, do believe these things. I've seen your performance in the I, nation. I'll state my position. Is it any help to anyone? Um, I wasn't living in America at the time, but I, I believe that. Uh, the American left, American radicals, American liberals, many of them, in starting the civil rights movement for black Americans, in combating an unjust war in Indochina, and in beginning the emancipation of women, the way we think about sex, uh, changed the way everyone thinks and the way everyone lives far beyond the borders of the United States. It was a tremendous time, and the whole world is in debt to the American left, I'd rather call it, for those three enterprises. Now it's true that they're all now in rather low water, those movements, but I see no reason to, to sneer at them now or to forget the grand contribution they made, unsurpassed by any, well, see, any conservative I rival. Sneering is, uh, is not the right uh, word. I would use uh, high indignation, and in, in one of the three you mentioned uh, uh, a, a moral sense of true shame to have guaranteed, as we did, that we were sent by uh, the South Vietnamese and desert them is something which is plain uh, shameful. Not, not mm -hmm. something you sneer about. Now let's, let's take civil rights, uh, uh, because in Mr. Uh, Tyrrell's book uh, he talks about how uh, what he, what we call, used to call liberals uh, indeed insisted on something called equality, uh, equality of opportunity, mm -hmm. and how in Brown versus Board of Education, the Supreme Court of the United States said that. Uh, it was un-American and indeed unconstitutional to take into account a person's uh, race or color or creed in uh, deciding whether somebody goes to the school or the other. Now, that has evolutionized. It's something called affirmative action and something now called quotas. That um, uh, is viewed by Ms. Terrell and by a lot of liberals who endorsed uh, the civil rights movement at that time, specifically for instance by Hugh Humphrey in a famous uh, speech, it's something that would never happen. Uh, and uh, that is uh, a distortion and, in fact, a return to a kind of uh, racism, however involuted. You, do, you, do you welcome what we call a distortion? It's probably, the worst, uh, it's probably the worst single problem that we, that we have on the left at the moment, because um, not only is it, as you say, known as or reminds people of quotas, I don't believe quotas is what it comes down to, it does involve a competition for scarce resources between two constituencies who've normally been on, as it were, our side, that's to say Jewish Americans and black Americans. And this has meant that life on our, on our wing of politics has been very tender. Um, I don't believe uh, that simply by legally abolishing discrimination, you have abolished what led to it, the original singling out of black Americans, the original meaning of discrimination, where they were, as mentioned, quoted, counted, and restricted. That yeah, by saying that now stops, you, you avoid any responsibility for the past, and you avoid the very tangled question of how we're going to make up for yeah, you make a the point. inherited um, disability. You make a cultural point. If, if you say, all right, henceforth, it will be perfectly legal, as indeed it should be, for blacks to uh, enter a restaurant, does not guarantee that every table will have one black and one white patron. No. Uh, and uh, the point is that any laws that sought to bring that about would be laws which, if, we, if one were properly grounded philosophically, one would resist rather fiercely, certainly more fiercely than you have. Mm. Now, what about um, what about the business of um, the women's movement? I despise uh, and am horrified by the sharp rise in family desertion, uh, and uh, it seems to me that uh, there is abundant uh, evidence to uh, argue that there has been a correlation between the so-called women's movement yeah. uh, and the neglect of children and broken. Home. The whole movement, as a matter of fact, has been a terrible failure. A few minutes ago, you talked as though this has been a great success, what's happened to America. Uh, the, tr the truth of the matter is that a great many kids are, what is it, they're called latchkey key children, and they live without parents. There's evidence that there's a high in in uh, incidence of uh, uh, juvenile delinquency associated with these kids that are raised in homes without uh, uh, a father on the scene. Uh, and there's also uh, evidence that right within the women's movement that some of these women who 20 years ago were telling uh, uh, the young ladies of America, America to go out and get careers, you know, careers, not jobs, but careers, 
are now finding out that uh, now it didn't come out so well and that the, uh, the women ought to go back and uh, uh, establish friendly relations again with the opposite sex and, and have children and, and live the uh, Ozzie and Harriet life once again. Uh, I would feel a little bitter if I were a 45-year-old woman who had given my life over to following the dictates of, of uh, Betty Friedan and finding out that Betty had decided that on, on, on uh, second thought, perhaps the women of America ought to go back, uh, these 45-year-old women ought to go back and, and become mothers again. There's a very good book um, with a title in some way similar to yours, much better book, by George well, Dangerfield. It? It's called The Strange Death of Liberal England. It's a wonderful book. You may have read it. It's uh, A.J.P. Taylor's favourite book. That may not commend well, it. Cool. That may not commend it. You know, you just live in a world I, of I mention it, you're very sweet to say so. I mention it for this reason. It's a, it's a wonderful evocation of pre-First World War Britain when the old system, which was basically a liberal one, came under tremendous shocks from the movement for women's suffrage, the movement to disengage from Ireland, and the rise of organized labor. And in the chapter on the rise of women's suffrage, he describes beautifully all the morbid symptoms that appear when a long repressed, especially if sexually repressed, group begin to take their own measure. The suffragette, the suffragette movement, simply for women's franchise, for the right of women to vote, was attacked by all kinds of people for its weirdness, for the way that women started to dress as men, to neglect their families, to behave promiscuously, and many indeed of these symptoms, up to and including suicide on some occasions, uh, were indeed present. But when the air cleared, one could see that that was the result of the original repression. Mm. And when you say that women are now, as it were, looking for better relations, with the people with whom they broke off when they had to. You're making my Not point. Sex. That's a phase through which that movement had to pass. You if believe, you read you, you believe Aaron American Reich's, women were, were repressed well, if you, take, uh, if you read uh, Barbara Ehrenreich's wonderful book, uh, The Hearts of Men, Socialist Feminist book, God. you'll see, that, which calls for, now that we have more terms for equality, she said, with which to negotiate, let's make a deal with the men. Half our children are going to be boys. You don't we understand. Can't, we can't get along without yeah. them. Uh, men and women get married, as she wittily points out, exactly the same numbers. Um, let's do it, but let's do it now, because we're now we're going to be taken more but seriously. But you don't understand that throughout this stressful. century here in America, with the exception of black people, particularly in the South, that this has been a free society, do you? I mean, I mean you, know, you think the Women's Christian Temperance Union, for instance, to mention one of the, the uh, uh, repressive uh, movements that rose up and, and disappeared in this country, you don't believe that was dominated and run by women, do you? You think it was probably run by men, probably Buckley, the Buckley family. Hmm? Um, I know there's a joke there that I've missed. Yeah. Um, I'm so the Joe, the, the, the Joe, well, had you read the book, you'd know it. Read it with care. Prepare to quote from it again. You'd know, that, you'd know that the Women's Christian Temperance Union had an enormous amount of political power in this supposed the country that, uh, that you feel uh, repressed women in the uh, first part of the Or as you so brightly say, feminist demands are a horse laugh. The average American woman has actually controlled two bodies and sometimes more, usually by employing only one or two parts of her own. I mean, I, yeah, I would have, I'm so glad I didn't write it myself. Uh, the, the fact is, um, you, for, your, for your position to be even humorous, you'd have to say that all the women who felt themselves excluded from large parts of American life, underpay or undervalued or underregarded or in other ways taken for granted, were making it all up, that it was just a spree of neurosis. You know, what what ladies are like hang on about. That, that must be what you believe. In fact, I think it's pretty evident that you do. No, no, wait, 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 let, me, let, me, uh, let me talk about something else you said. You, you suggested that inevitably post-emancipation there is a, a period of exorbitant behavior, mm -hmm. and uh, one oughtn't to be uh, surprised by this. And uh, there's a certain sense in which um, what you say is not impossible to validate historically when the Latin Americans fought to free themselves from foreign tyrants, they submitted to their own tyrants. Exactly the same thing has happened in Africa. We've taken a long, deep breath, 150 years have gone by, and uh, a few nations in Latin America are flirting with democracy. It hasn't quite happened uh, substantially in Africa, but maybe it will in uh, a due course. It's certainly true that uh, the whole notion that there would have to be oppression from the center after the Socialist Revolution uh, tended for a long time to immunize uh, Stalin and before that uh, Lenin from the kind of criticisms which they had so abundantly uh, earned. Uh, I, I maintain, however, that uh, even if you are making a sociologically interesting point, what you are by no means doing 
is justifying uh, any cessation of criticism during the Senate rule. That is to say, uh, if you do have a Colonel E.D. Amin uh, uh, in exchange for the predecessor colonial power, the fact that you say, well, this kind of thing is going to happen before it involves a democracy mm -hmm. does not uh, say, therefore, you shouldn't be indignant about it or, or oppose it. And Mr. Terrell's thesis really is that uh, let, let us indeed hope that some of the extremist uh, feminists uh, go back and behave and worry about things like families. Uh, but why can't we hasten uh, that repatriation by uh, sensible criticism? Well, I don't think it was sensible criticism that I was just citing. You're, but, you're, you're, I have no quarrel with, no with your methodology at all. But in fact, Mr. Terrell is saying, I just did say, that he thinks the whole thing was just a spree, it was all made up, it was promiscuity and exorbitance for its own sake, that there was nothing to, that they had nothing to complain about. Now, your point, I think, is much more challenging for me because, I mean, you raised the whole question of emancipation and yeah. at what cost it comes uh, in at. And, um, and, and, is, and you is mentioned it, Amin is and necessary and the election phase. Yeah, um, the, the, the position we on the left keep finding ourselves in is the victims of a sort of three-card trick. The position we on the left keep finding ourselves in is the victims of a sort of three-card trick. We take uh, the example of, say, Iran, which Mr. Terrell dwells upon quite a lot. We said for a long time it was a mistake for the United States to overthrow the government of Iran in 1954, a crime, in fact, and a mistake to impose the Shah. We said if you keep the Shah in power, it won't work. Uh, he's a real a failure, a real tyrant, and there will be hell to pay. When the hell to pay actually comes and we're proved right, the chaos turns on everybody, and who's identified as the wrong person to have been? We are, for having told you. you know, and we're supposed to take the blame for the collapse of what we always oppose. But this, now, this, you know, this, 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 this is the three-card trick that's played throughout this book, yeah, and it's played you know, very widely at the moment by the way. He believes in a world without problems. He believe, he's well, an ideologue. Well, he has really. set, he, you have, you're an ideologue, you have this set of ideas here before you, this, ideo, this set of ideological desiderata before you. And you believe that if, if everything, if we, we live up to this desider, these desiderata, uh, everything will be all right. There won't be problems. There won't be difficulties in, in uh, 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 government in Iran. There won't be difficulties in South America. There won't be difficulties between a man and a woman. You are, well, I, I see now how the ideological mind has a utopian cast. I'll, I'll, let, the, I'll, I'll let the viewers be the judge of, of whether I sound as if I believe any of that. Well, the, the, um, the, 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 the difficulty with integrating your analysis is that uh, you assume, and in the first place, uh, one, one should never use mistake and, and crime uh, uh, as a coterminous in, in, in political situations. Uh, uh, crime involves a mens rea, and there was no mens rea that I can think of uh, in mm -hmm. attempting to remove Mossadegh, who was a self-proclaimed uh, dictator. Now, you, you, you are also asking us to believe that if in 1954 Mossadegh had taken over, these, the age of Khomeini would never have come. Well, uh, presumably not. But this doesn't argue that uh, the removal of Mossadegh was not at that time the judicious thing to do. And it certainly brought uh, 30 years or 25 years of a relative progress in Iran by your standards. That is to say, attempts to get more hospitals, more schooling, more literacy, uh, more, more what we call... Well, what about the women? Well, well, first, what about the women? first um, you're familiar with the joke expression, worse than a crime and mistake. I mean, I'm sorry if I was conflating the two. I think um, mistake would be euphemism, crime might be an overstatement. Uh, let's say, anyway, historic blunder. Um, note the irony. If you read the memoirs of those, Kermit Roosevelt with CIA and uh, Christopher Woodhouse of British Intelligence who organized the overthrow of Mossadegh, you'll notice that their main allies in the overthrow of the Iranian left and center left were the mullahs, that it was the, the mobs of backward fanatics and religious um, leadership the, the, the who were employed to, to do that job and who were thus given a larger role in Iran in the first place. The Shah continually compromised with them too. Indeed, uh, though he blasphemed them by calling himself in one of his own titles the shadow of God, uh, he certainly posed always as the defender of Shia Islam. Shia Islam is not a new political phenomenon in Iran just because it was only discovered by the newspapers when the Shah was collapsing. Um, I still, I'd still like to reiterate my grievance if you don't think I'm sounding plaintive. It's that 
Now we're attacked because it's all gone wrong in Iran and life there is hell. Um, and there's a, a filthy theocratic dictatorship where for some reason they can't seem to separate religion and politics. And I'm no doubt there's mandatory school prayer. Um, we who warned that this would happen if it went on under the despotism of the Shah are now blamed for it and made to carry the can. Well, you are blamed in the sense that you were the point man uh, at a critical period during which we forced the Shah to behave in a way that proved suicidal. You, do, you don't, uh, when a regime is tottering, urge that particular moment for amnesty for all political prisoners. It doesn't make much sense, yeah. does it? Well, not, no, I've been calling for that amnesty from long before. I wouldn't stop calling for it just because the regime was tottering. No, I mean, you'd be asking I, me to do the impossible. Well, it, it depends on whether you have the clairvoyance to see what the immediate alternatives are. Unhappily, Mr. Carter did not, right? Well, if you had clairvoyance, you wouldn't be in that position in the first place. So I think you've, there's an undistributed middle no, in your no, no, uh, no, 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 I'm careful about undistributed middle. The, uh, if there were the no, foresight, no. if you prefer, uh, to see to it that there wasn't a third alternative waiting in the wings in Iran, there was going to be either this madman or the, this, uh, uh, the czar, uh, the czar, the Shah, who uh, in fact was rather liberal oriented uh, as these people go. Uh, if you knew that there was no third alternative, one ought not to have hesitated to back uh, the Shah. That, that's not, not an ideological position, and, and certainly one with which I should think, given that you so, uh, 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 so convincingly deplore the excesses of the uh, Ayatollah, for instance, school prayer, that you are, uh, would agree with me about this. I'm prepared to leave you occupying the position that, um, that the Shah could have been safe, because you'd rather say could, I suspect, uh, in your best moments, you'd rather say could than should have been safe. But note that you're putting the worst case straight away. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure to, I'm I'm to say what you do when, when a man has plunged you into a position where he says it's either me or barbarism. I would say you'd have to ask who is this guy that he's led us to that choice. Well, and right. that is the same mistake as you made with Somoza. Um, and have, have, as you have made with us, no, we're in the process of making it in the Philippines. And yeah. again, we're going to, I can tell who's going to be blamed when it goes wrong. The people who never thought Somoza or Marcos was a good bet in the first place are going to be well, blamed. Have, well, we're going to be told we lost the Philippines. Yeah, but we actually have <coughs> not such a magnificent control of the, uh, the public forums that you haven't been blamed for anything, so don't worry about it. I find it more interesting if I might... Does uh, it feel like that? Uh, I, mean, I mean, you've you got this terrible... Uh, uh, sense that everybody's ganging up. And this is, this is about a very <coughs> uncomfortable bill. You know, we outnumbered Fort Christopher two to one here, and we disagree with him. I'd like to try to agree with him on something just to, you know, to be uh, kind of uh, chummy and not to look at, because it's very unusual for you who have spent 30 years of public life being outnumbered uh, mm -hmm. by, by the media in this country. Uh, and and uh, I have spent 45 years of public life being much your senior. You're doing a day of uh, to, to kind of gang up on poor Christopher, but let me let's can we turn the, the can we return to America uh, because I think it's very interesting. Yeah, we're, the, through, we're through with Iran. Uh, well, if we could, I mean, because the, the, the it's factual, you raise it in your book. So factual, uh, one of the big problems in Iran, of course, was that Iran had a very small middle class, and it's very hard to have democratic politics in a huge country like that with a tiny middle class. Uh, and uh, the huge number of backward people that you had all in allegiance to, or owing allegiance, or uh, owing their affinities to, to the mullahs. I mean, that basically the problem isn't ideological. There, there was a problem of practical politics. Let me ask a question un un sarcastically. What percentage of Great Britain was middle class, say, in 19, 1830? In 1830, yeah. Would you say as, as high as 15, 20? Mm -hmm. Well, it's difficult to gauge because it, that's before the reform bill when mm -hmm. it was decided on, on what basis yeah. one was yeah. a middle class enough to be allowed but to vote. But it would be around that, wouldn't it? The, re the reason I point to that out is that uh, this was a period when England did not allow <coughs> to, to women, to Jews, or to Catholics. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and yet uh, history isn't uh, as harsh on the George IV as uh, we are urged to be on the Shah of Iran. We're far, far fewer than 25% of the Iranians were members of the middle class. So that, that gives us perhaps a useful historical perspective. Go ahead. I've never no, thought of him as George IV before, I must say. Uh, you know, Christopher, you're a, a, an unusual creature in American life in that you are so rigidly ideological. And uh, uh, this is, uh, by the way, something I blame you uh, Europeans for bringing over to our shores, is this ideological cast of mind, which I believe, uh, 
Uh, but we got to see homegrown ideologies. Uh, well, but it's always, I, I know we do, and it's, mis it's unfortunate that we do, but uh, nonetheless, I think it owes itself to uh, European politics, and the European criticism of America has often been that we aren't ideological enough. But, you know, one of the things that I think, uh, points I make in the liberal crack-up is that it's an ideological cast of mind that leads to the kind of enthusiasm and intoler uh, uh, irrational enthusiasm that you see uh, making the liberal uh, wing of the uh, Democratic Party such an unmanageable menagerie today. Well, it's not. It's not, not by the way, for instance, uh, the New Deal under Roosevelt was not nearly so ideological as the present uh, the present Democratic Party and. I might point out a point that I like to make in this book is that there's a, uh, there is no line in logic or in, in policy, no direct line from uh, the, the, the New Deal to the present uh, gag of oh, enthusiasm. Oh, that's a sure view then. I figured that because we did. Yeah, I wanted to... A, lot, that a, lot, a lot of critics of the New Deal said what's, what we have opened the doors to is the kind of thing that is not happening. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if you measure the distance between, let's say, the vector of Roosevelt's policies and those of uh, Calvin Coolidge, you would probably find that distance uh, much, much greater than the distance between Roosevelt's and LBJ's. Well, I don't know. Uh, well, the I Communist don't... Party at the time, at one stage, would call the New Deal fascism. And many uh, leading American business organizations said that Roosevelt was at least a socialist, if not worse. Yeah. And I suppose that might be the measure of how non-ideological it was. I mean, I've now been told I have to stick up for the position of intolerance and ideological rigidity, and that I've imported it to the United States, States which I think could probably have acquired it without me, but I did begin, I was reminded, I began by saying that when I still lived in England before I became an immigrant, um, I was, as many, many millions of people were, very inspired by um, the American examples, in particular Dr. King, but also later uh, the movement to arrest the um, unjust war in Indochina. What about Jefferson? And, and as I say, it was, it was American women who in who really began to show women in the advanced countries that they needn't live uh, on the assumptions that dictated their lives up to then. These were the examples that stirred me, and that I still am inclined to defend. Well, there you are again. I and mean, there you go again. You're, you're in favor of... Uh, you, the trouble with the ideological cast of mind that you exhibit here is one of the problems is that it tends to uh, politicize more and more areas, areas of American life. I contend that uh, men and women never had to be politicized on the grounds of sex. Uh, sexual or, or gender. Uh, well, they, well they surely they had to when they weren't allowed to vote. You had to politicize the, the movement to give them the vote. Well, uh, I'm talking about the present, in the present. Uh, and, it's, and what you had, the reason uh, you had, uh, what, what the historic evolution of women in this country was, was towards greater and greater freedom brought about by two things. One, the uh, uh, birth control pill and the other by uh, the need to get out and get into the workforce, uh, economic reasons. And there's no reason that we, and this was going on, I mean, the, the uh, trend was very clear that more and more women were going into the workforce. Uh, and there's no reason to believe that this had to be politicized. Uh, naturally, when they got into the workforce, when they got down to the uh, office, there weren't enough uh, women's uh, uh, restrooms. But uh, you see, the difference between you and me is, I say this was a historical evolution, and you say, this was uh, an example of, uh, of uh, uh, conscious repression uh, by the American male, probably white. You probably throw that. Okay. No, I didn't say that. That's not what I meant. But you would say that you would, if, if you were given, a, you do believe that. You no, you already said that you thought women were repressed in this country. What I what I'll say I've noticed as a person who is, as you would have noticed, both white and male, is that um, attitudes of my peer group other people like me, who are white and male, I mean by that, towards women have undergone a vast improvement in the last 15 years or so. One of the good things about the civil rights movement was how it improved the moral standards of white people. And I think one of the great things about the women's movement, or the feminist movement, if you like, uh, is that it's changed the way that men think. And I think, and David, that's it's, it's been for our sake as well as theirs. That's what is good about reform movements, is they're not what are now called interest groups or, or selfish, narrow, contained things. But you, yes, you of need to be enlightened that. in your treatment of women because you're from England. And the English, as we all know, have always had a, 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 a sense of uh, 
the di- uh, a di- uh, an ex- what? Of separatism. Of separatism. I mean, you, you, well, most uh, you, most you, you might very well be a member of, a, of an English men's club right now. Most, well, of, most Americans seem to think that Englishmen um, take the view that gentlemen prefer gentlemen anyway. Yeah. I, I can't argue with that. I mean, I know what our reputation is. It'll take a lot of living down. Well, let's not probe that one. But, you know, going back to the Tokyo, the Tokyo pointed out that in this country, women were freer, traveled, uh, given more dignity, uh, more self-assertive than any place else in the world. Uh, so we actually have, you know, the truth is, you also have this notion that America uh, has a great deal to be ashamed of. I don't. I think it's a wonderful country, and I, I'm yeah. delighted to live here, and I, I can see I you're happy to, I went now. to more trouble to live here than you did, Mr. Sorrell. I, I, you were just born here. I, I went to more trouble across the Atlantic. I like it, I like it well enough to have done that. It's of course the American woman is assertive. If they weren't, they wouldn't have started the, um, the feminist movement in the, in the 70s. It took assertive women to do that. Yeah. I mean, what what do you expect? Why do you think you've answered me? Of course, the whole thing didn't have to be done. My point is, far more of venom was exchanged in the in the uh, this advance of women that you talk about. I think it's a mixed blessing uh, because I think uh, the same for every woman that happily got herself a career, there were ten mothers made miserable for having to stay home and take care of the kids. And people like you and Betty Friedan and and Gloria Steinem and, and then the fanatics out there, uh, of course, made life for those mothers raising kids at home all the more miserable with those, all, that awful question that would always be asked at the, at the cocktail party to, to some uh, uh, perfectly sensible mother, what do you do? Oh, what do you do? Uh, my wife, uh, of course, translates French for the American Spectator, does reviews for the American Spectator, reviews Buckley's books for the American Spectator, and uh, she's too, uh, too Authentic to say, ah, it sounds like, sounds like chapel slavery to me, your wife's existence, I must say. It's because I do wonderful literature. I'm now, for heaven's sake, told that I'm against motherhood, too. Yeah. Um, oh, no. Look at you, you, see, you have this persecution yeah. complex. You have a persecution complex. That's Not another problem that the left has in this country. We're no, yeah. I just told you that we're good, that in fact Bill just tried to criticize me for something, so we could let you off the hook. Sure, let's give you a good example. Because um, I attacked your ungallant um, use of um, words about women earlier on. Jean Kirkpatrick, say, or Mitch Decker, your great friend, and Jean Kirkpatrick, your great heroine, are people who, with whom I have really tremendous political disagreements, um, immense ones, I mean, quite unreconciled ones. I do not say in my column, the old bitch, the old bag, the old douchebag, the old dog, the old pig, um, she's only in politics because she's hideous, she can't find a man. I don't say, as you say, of my sisters yes. on the left, disagreeable misanthropes, horrible to behold, uncouth and unlovely. Did you now, see and, and, in, and they were inferior women. I didn't now, see it. Did now, you hear douchebag, Bill? Um, now, now, Billingsgate, I will not. 20, 20 years suit. ago, 20 years ago or so, um, there would have been the temptation to, uh, to say that by a female opponent would have been very strong. Um, and probably a lot of us would have yielded to it. But we've actually. We men on the left have yeah. all become infinitely nicer, more yeah. charming, White. more stylish, more gallant than you. How many times have I been the chauvinist The, 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 the conservatives who, the conservatives who say that it's terrible these days women don't want the door held open before them anymore. Yeah. Will you defend me whatever I'm called a chauvinist like pig, a chauvinist pig, a Nazi, a fascist, and all that stuff? No, you I'm not a fascist. I'm not a fascist when I see one. And? And I call him a fascist when I do. And do you see one? But of course, the problem there is if someone is a fascist. The problem there is if someone is a fascist, it's not an insult because if you call a Nazi a Nazi, you're not being rude to him, are you? Um, so one can waste a lot of breath. In well, I don't know. I think, I think it's if, very you see, you, if you see an ugly woman, you call her ugly. You're saying you're being rude. <laughs> one, depends. It depends. That, that the question of timing is everything. Yeah. Timing is everything. The question is when do you break it to her? <laughs> Depends on your value system, too. Maybe she admires Well, I think if you're a clinic, I suppose. Uh, Do you in any way see my point, or am I just being sentimentous? Well, uh, yeah, I think you are. I mean, after all, I, my, point, my point is that, that in political discourse, you and your sisters, as you put it, in that awfully uncomfortable way, once again suggestive of an ideological cast of mind, you, you attack me for calling uh, women misanthropes, or feminists misanthropes. But uh, what about horrible and unlovely? Yes. And but what about what about uh, uh, the, the women on your side who would refer, refer to me as a chauvinist pig? As a matter of course. Well, I mean that went on all the time. 
Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think you all have seen all of them. They're different, too. They're absolutely serious. They are. Okay, but, uh, wait a minute, but, Bob, you, you can't, uh, you can't uh, uh, cite there this behavior as authorizing your own. No, but I don't think that I'm, uh, he said that, that he talked about the, uh, my language. A, first of all, he said I used Billingsgate such as douchebag, and of course then he went on, and there was no such word there. Those words are perfectly I acceptable. I say you said it, I was content to quit, all right. Uh, those words are perfectly acceptable. And I see nothing wrong with it, with describing feminists who have uh, have been so misanthropic as misanthropes. In However, I would not. I do think that it takes a certain flight of mind to, to refer to a person like me as a chauvinist pig. But Christopher just pointed out that it's not. A, that, that's exactly what I am. I've, so. I've also read your book more carefully than you have. It says, in the new age, all women would be hags. This was the logical imperative of the feminist revolution. That's right. That's what they want. They wanted to be there. It's their, their yeah, point, a, the feminist really, point. It's followed by a really sad abuse of H.R. Mencken's prayers. Um, <laughs> uh, don't think you have the right to pray him in aid uh, for a sentence like that. But you see, we don't have to, on the left, go around politicizing things when they you already are. Politicized. No, they already are. We, we found them that way, mm. and we decided to call it, it, it by its right name. I mean, as we sit here, for instance, um, everyone in this room um, has been made into a frontline soldier. Um, the nuclear age means that we're all conscripted. We don't have the right to conscientious objection anymore. We are in the front line while the soldiers are in the bunkers. A complete redefinition of the meaning of war of the civilian. Um, that's being done to us, uh, whether we like it or not. We can't then complain of those who object that they're politicizing the situation. The politicization has been done. We're all conscripted. We might as well be sitting here in uniform. Well, you sound, you sound like one of the uh, and that fanatic, was in you sound like some fanatic libertarian who would say the same thing. We have to pay taxes. We've already been conscripted. We've been forced to. to uh, well, I don't think that's a. I don't think that's a very. I think that's a terribly good comparison. Good enough. Yeah, well, it's it's because we haven't been conscripted. It's good enough. You thought there was that. There's a sense in which uh, uh, it, it is true that. Uh, we live in an age in which two or three people can decide on the future of the planet. And uh, therefore, uh, any overtures to those people uh, require a political exertion. It is, however, not true, uh, as uh, Mr. Hitchens uh, seems to want to believe, that it therefore follows as a corollary, uh, that uh, all movements and all relationships are equally politicized for that reason. It's true that there's no significant difference between the man in the trenches and the man in the Park Avenue in terms of apocalyptic exchange. It is not true that uh, a housewife ought to feel that she is a part of an ongoing political uh, movement. And it certainly is true in my judgment, as Mr. Um, Terrell has argued, that uh, an effort has been made to say to all women, you are not only women, you're not only mothers, you're not only homemakers, you're not only writers, whatever. You are also women qua women. Jackson, Jesse Jackson, gets up and he says, I'm a black man first and an American second. Uh, in saying that, he gives an order of priorities, which tells a lot about him, which would have made Martin Luther King shut up, for instance. Now, <coughs> I, I, I deny that we ought to uh, permit ourselves to be so politicized. Do not deny that the effort is being made. Do insist that that uh, uh, effort can be successfully resisted. But before we, hmm. we've only got a minute to let out, I, you made three little random remarks about Vietnam. Huh. The last one was the uh, unjust uh, war. Um, yes. Lots of volumes were written on Vietnam, but uh, let me record that uh, I had no reason, I had no reason 15 years ago to think it was Vietnam was unjust. As days go by, I am progressing, progressively convinced that that which was unjust about it was our position in the field of people whom we had rallied to the cause of liberty in the course of explicating a series of arrangements uh, made with the benediction of your government, labor and, and uh, uh, non-labor, and of the governments of the Western Europe during the 50s. Just to their eternal shame, yes, that's Well, I don't think that Lord Churchill would be uh, embarrassed by it, nor Bevan, nor Cripps. Uh, but the war, war ended, the war ended in a squalid and dishonorable way as it was began. Uh, that's how it began. Yeah, it began I in a squalid and dishonorable I don't doubt that it did. And it couldn't uh, have been otherwise. It, it is that work. Uh, what do you mean? Nothing but, became it as it were like the leaving of it. But it began in a squad in some other way. way. The leaving of it hardly became it. If, if you mean, if you mean 200,000 boat people became or leaving Vietnam, I think that you have no... You were talking, of the, you're talking of the American departure from Vietnam. Yeah. Well, what were you talking about? 
I was, to, uh, I was talking about them, I think the Bosch did now. I was replying to you. Yeah, uh, and, and, and in my opinion, a war so scholarly conceived would, could hardly be, have been honorably ended. The Vietnam War ended in 1954 when French colonialism was defeated at Dien Bien Phu. That's when the war was lost. You know, and that's who lost it. You know, All subsequent um, depredations by successive American governments, often supported by the British, the British government, though never, I think, by the French, who learned their lesson by then, to go warn Kennedy a long time ago what would happen. Do you believe that the resistance to communism was squalid? No, I didn't say that. No, but I, I, I don't understand that, you, even the logic of what you're saying. No, I, 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 like, I don't blame you for trying, to, I don't blame you for trying to change the no, subject. No, no, we're talking about who lost the Vietnam War and when and why. No, I'm no, yeah, offering I mean, you my view. It's like saying that the, um, that the Philippines are really lost. When we pulled out the Philippines in 1948, uh, we, in effect, ended uh, a relationship with uh, uh, Filipinos who were democracy. Uh, I mean, the hooks uh, mm -hmm. really are the natural heirs. Uh, of the, I simply deny it. I see no reason at all why that mad uh, uh, poet uh, Ho Chi Minh, specializing in, in torture and oppression, uh, should have been encouraged uh, uh, when there is ample evidence to be that there are South Vietnamese who preferred uh, uh, liberty and who should have been convinced that we had no neo-colonialist designs in South Vietnam. Ho Chi Minh was good enough to be an American ally against the Japanese uh, during the Second World War, when he, when he became right. acknowledged as the leader of Vietnamese yes. nationalism, whatever yeah. his other Stalinist yes. traits may be, which I don't deny or seek to deny. And Stalin was good enough um, to be an ally against such as so what? It, well, so quite a lot, isn't it? So not very much. No, I think so. So, 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 Right. Not particularly flattering, but this is, this is the kind of thing that uh, I'm unhappy the world is made up of, where so many political choices need to be made. Tough where ones, would you tough resist ones, communism? tough ones too. Where, where would you resist uh, uh, communism? Where well, would you resist a communist uh, overthrow of government? Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that, you. With, uh, with, well, with force. Uh, both, questions, both questions are good. With nuclear weapons, I, I wouldn't, there are no circumstances which would justify um, unleashing thermal nuclear weapons. Uh, no outcome could be worse than that. So, which I don't think is your own opinion. Um, I, I, I think that's to say there are worse things than communism, and by saying it, that's what I mean by it, in case you might want to reinterpret so, so, what so I So you would be in favor of unilateral disarmament as Neil Kinnock is? Yes, of course. Uh, yeah. so, 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 if, you, if, you don't, if you're not going to use weapons of genocide and suicide, mm -hmm. you shouldn't be preparing to use them. No, so you prefer biological survival to freedom. And that, that's a very important I don't point. prefer it, but I would... I would prefer it. Uh, prefer it. I, would I, would I, would I don't say those are the alternatives. Perhaps I should have spoken, uh, I'm, I'm have spoken less, less rapidly. Thank I don't think those are the choices, yes. Thank you, Mr. Christopher Hitchens, and thank you, Mr. R. Emmett uh, Tyrrell, author of The Liberal Crack-Up. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen of Yonkers Press.